say, this is a historic occasion. We think this is the beginning of the working class in Britain getting back off its knees and starting to fight back. So thank you all for coming. I hope this is an occasion that you're going to participate in enthusiastically um, and that you're going to remember that is going to inspire you to go away and work and build and you're going to be glad in the future that you were here, that you were part of the beginning of something that really matters for working people here and everywhere else. And thank you also to all of those on social media who will be joining us. As we know, we talk very often. We, in the, in the left, in the progressive movement, in the working class movement, about the need for a new media. A media which bypasses the stranglehold of the imperialist corporations and their false narrative and fake news. Yeah, yeah. And this new party has two great strengths. Um, one is that it comes from an entirely anti-imperialist perspective. No longer are we going to tell workers that there is a way for them to win what they need without getting rid of the system of imperialism. We know it can't happen. The other great strength we have is that our leader, George Galloway, has already made the most significant break from the mainstream, so-called the corporate media in this country. He has the biggest audience, the most independent presence in the media, in this country, on the internet, um, in Britain that we know of, and that is a massive advantage for us now. And so we know that the live stream of this meeting and subsequent videos of the speeches from this meeting will be watched by thousands of people in Britain and many more around the world. Um, not just today, but over the coming weeks, months and years, our reach will just extend and extend. It's one of the reasons, of course, why those who want to censor the internet are starting to try to target George in particular, because he represents something that is truly frightening to them. So I'm sure George is going to talk about that and many more things later on today. The only thing I wanted to talk about very briefly um, was a meeting I had recently, and I think it's so it, the message that came out of that was something very important uh, for workers here as everywhere else. This time last week, I was in a meeting in Caracas with the Foreign Minister of Venezuela. And in that meeting, there were representatives from countries on every continent in the world. Some of them leaders of states, some of them ministers. Uh, one of them was a former minister in the Syrian government. Um, there were many important people representing the working class, the struggling masses of the entire world were in that meeting. And a really important statement came from the minister. He was talking to us about the struggle in Venezuela. And he said it in its context. He said, you know, when the Berlin Wall fell, 1989, 1990, he said, young progressive people in Latin America, we felt demoralized, we felt lost. We didn't know what to do. The spirit of struggle continued, but our faith in Marxism was gone. And when the old veteran Marxist guerrillas would talk to us about Lenin and Marxism, we didn't want to listen. We said, this is old, this, is, this has been disproved, this is all gone. He said, our struggle in Venezuela has taught us something really important. Lenin was right. Lenin, his definition of imperialism was exactly right. We have learned now who and what our enemy is. And he said, he reported a meeting that he'd been in a week before with his Chinese equivalent someone from the Chinese Foreign Ministry, maybe the Chinese Foreign Minister himself, and he said that Chinese statesman had said to him, in order to fight our enemy and win, we must study our enemy 
we must understand our enemy. This year marks 150 years since the birth of Lenin. We must take this opportunity to understand what it was that Lenin taught us. Lenin is not some random abstract figure from the past. Lenin was the person, more than any other, who equipped the modern working class with the understanding of who is our enemy? How do you organise to fight your enemy? How do you beat your enemy? How do you build a new state for the workers, by the workers, of the workers? I want us to take into all of our work this year, and in this year in particular, to remember that we are not having to reinvent the wheel. There is a huge amount that has been done before that we can learn from, and we must learn from. Our conditions have changed, of course, but our enemy is the same enemy, and if we are not prepared to learn and study and understand that enemy, we can't fight and beat the enemy. But we know, we look around us, we see the urgency of fighting and beating the enemy. And I'm going to leave you with the words of the Venezuelan Foreign Minister, what he said when he closed his speech. He said, it was 200 years ago that Simon Bolivar, who they call the liberator of Latin America, was fighting against the empire. He said, we don't have another 200 years to play with to keep going backwards and forwards in this game. We have to be serious. We must unite our forces here and internationally. We must study, we must organise, we must win, because the future of humanity depends on it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Comrade Jyoti and brothers and sisters. I'm very happy to see so many people here uh, on a Saturday morning for this, the first public event held by the Workers' Party of Britain. I didn't intend to start this way, uh, but I listened closely to what Jyoti said. I am not myself a Leninist or a communist, but Lenin was right. And Lenin was right not just on imperialism. <laughs> Lenin was right about something else also. And that is the nature of the state, of the capitalist state here in Britain and in every country around the world where the working class is not in power. What do I mean by that? Well, actually, it ties in with something that Jyoti alluded to in her address. You see, a lot of us grew up, even the oldest of us grew up, in the mist of a mythology that we lived in a democracy, that if we persuaded enough people to vote for us, we could peacefully, democratically achieve the goals that we had stood for election in. And that there were institutions in Britain which stood aside from the partisan political fray that we could rely on, that were as old as the hills. My father, God rest him, was one of those who believed that Britain was a special kind of place in that regard. That our institutions were actually better and more dependable than the institutions of many other countries. I recall my father talking about corruption, for example, in government as being something that happened somewhere else. I'm sorry to say he actually had a particular thing about corruption in Italy. Uh, at that time. The governments were corrupt in Italy, but not here. We didn't have that problem. That the police in America uh, might be unjust, might be discriminatory, uh, might 
select people, profile people, and victimize them, but not here. That the Americans had awful television, but we had the BBC. I swear to you, this is not ancient history. This is, in my lifetime, in his lifetime, these kind of things were believed. Courts, for example, the idea that we would have corrupted judicial systems was something beyond the ken of my own father, who's only 20 years dead. And yet any of us following the Julian Assange case now know that that too is a lie. The belief that the state represented of the people and that its armed forces, its intelligence services. Hello to the MI5 man in the room, by the way. <laughs> if you stand up, we'll welcome you. We have no problem with you. The idea that these organs of the state were independent of politics and would obey the constitutional order well, that died for me a long time ago because I had the uh, privilege, go with me on this, of late in his life becoming a close friend of Harold Wilson, the Labour Prime Minister, 64, 66, 74, 74. And I spent untold hours, because Harold could talk, listening to the story of how he as a Labour Prime Minister and not even a left-wing Labour Prime Minister was bugged and burgled and destabilised by elements within the British security services. How his phone, the Prime Minister's phone, was being bugged by the security services. Many of us have read and seen the movie a very British coup. Well, that happened to Harold Wilson, and he had no intention of turning Britain into a socialist country. They just thought that he might, thought that he might lead Britain in that direction. And if any of you think that Jeremy Corbyn, about whom more later, was not consciously undermined and destabilized by most of these institutions I have just referred to, then you need to get reading and learning. If any of you think that, that the security services, that the armed forces, that the organs of the state would have saluted Jeremy Corbyn as he sought to implement a policy, a program on which the people had elected him without seeking to disrupt it, without seeking to block it. Again, you need to give yourself a shake. What happened to Corbyn was the state as it actually is deliberately and systematically destroying the possibility of any decisive break from the prevailing orthodoxy in this country, partly on domestic affairs, but I think that's overestimated. The state can bear a penny on the tax or, or a, a, a penny off the tax or a, a minute off the day they can bear that up to a point. The real problem that Corbyn represented for them was that he was not a reliable tool for imperialism and Britain's imperialist role in the world. They could not be sure. They could not be sure that Corbyn would join imperialist wars. They could not be sure that Corbyn would not seek to boycott, divest, sanction regimes in the world that were oppressing people 
in their millions and for decades. They could not be sure that Corbyn would press the button. Actually, we don't press the button anyway. The Polaris, the Trident is controlled from the United States, but you get what I mean. They could not be sure of Corbyn's loyalty, not to the British people. To them, I'm sure he was entirely loyal, but to the British state and its role in the world. And the state and the people are different things, entire and separate things. And Lenin was right about that. Now let me start where I was going to start. I'll be speaking for a little while, so if you are bored or you want to question me on something, put up your hand and I'll take you right away whilst I'm speaking. Uh, one of my friends here, I haven't seen him since 1982, which is nothing in my lifetime, but a lot in some of yours. And he reminds me that I came to speak to the Leith Labour Party in 1982. And we were reminiscing before we started today, and it's, it was funny and sad at the same time. We were remembering characters. And one person who was at that meeting in 1982 was a man I had first met at Waverley Station where he was handing out Trotskyite tracts to bewildered railwaymen going into their work in Waverley Station. He was a fully bearded Trotskyite, fully committed to the Trotskyite cause. His name was Alistair Darling. Now Lord Alistair Darling, on the board of several banks. And I remembered and told my friend here today the day when I had a meeting with him, I on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party as its chairman, and my late friend Bill Spears, then the Secretary General of the Scottish TUC. We met with Alistair Darling and someone else, another bearded Trotsky, I, I forget his name, forgive me if you're watching, former comrade. And to talk to them about strategy over rates, because they were the leaders of the Lothian Regional Council and they were acting illegally, refusing to set a rate, you remember that period. And I remember Alistair Darling clearly. I can still see his mustachioed lip moving when he said to me, you, you're nothing but a reformist. <laughs> Which, for those of you who've been long on the left, is just about the biggest insult you can uh, pay someone. I was the reformist. Alistair Darling was the revolutionist. <laughs> and then I next saw him or rather, next clashed with him in those few days, which now that I look back on them are almost like a dream, when the British banks were literally falling before our eyes. The British financial system was coming apart at the seams. There were queues of people outside banks trying to get their money out, being told they couldn't. Everything looked to be on a precipice. But Gordon and Alistair came in as caped crusaders to save the capitalist financial system from itself. And in the parliamentary debate, this was literally happening in real time. The banks were collapsing as we were there debating it in the chamber of the House of Commons. And Alistair said, when someone asked him, well, we're bailing all these banks out, hundreds of billions, hundreds of billions of taxpayers' money, are we going to at least 
take a seat on the board of these banks on behalf of the people whose money it is that is saving them. And Alistair the Trotskyite said, and I quote, you know he did Alistair, it's there in black and white in Hansen. I've never been in favour, he said, of governments having seats on the boards of banks. I could take it no longer. I rose in my place and said, will the right honourable gentleman give way? Right honourable and learned, I think I said, because he's a QC. He resumed his seat and I said, you've never been in favour of governments having seats on the boards of banks. When I first met you, you were a bearded Trotskyite handing out tracts to bewildered railwaymen at Waverley Station. And he looked like he'd seen a ghost. <laughs> Which in a way he had. The ghost of Christmas past. The ghost of his past. Why do I dwell on this poor man who's of little importance uh, to us now? It's first to make the point that some of us have stood the test of time. My politics are the same this day as they were that day and the day before and the day before. In parenthesis, Dr. John Reed, when I first met him, he was a leading figure in the Communist Party. He later became Tony Blair's war minister, pulverizing the children of Iraq. Once I said to him, when I first met you, you taught us the songbook of the Irish Republican movement. You gave us books to read about Lenin and Marx. He said, yes, I used to believe in Santa Claus also. I said, not when you were 35 with a PhD with a PhD from Stirling University. Some of us have stood the test of time. That is my point. And it's one of the points on which I appeal here and through this camera to all socialists in Britain. There is nothing alien about us. We are what you were. We are what you are. And we are what the Labour Party is not and will never be again, will never be again. Which is a good point to mention, happy Brexit day to all of us who fought for so long. We fought for this for so long and the person in the world, in the other life that I am remembering now is my lifelong friend at whose side I stood from 1974 and at whose coffin I stood in Westminster Abbey. I remember the late and great and right honourable Tony Benn, who fought for Brexit better than, longer than anyone else. And he had the vision. See, there are people that you meet along the way in politics. The way he put it, it's not entirely accurate in my view, is there are signposts and there are weather vanes. Well, because I spent so much time with Mr. Ben, as a youth, I was 20 years old when I started with him. I learned so much from him. There are signposts, and he was one, of course, the greatest. But there are also men, women, who can see things, who can see ahead who can see on the basis of intelligence, of reading, of education, yes, in many cases, who can see 
because of their age and experience who can see where things are going. And when Mr. Ben said in 1975, and I was there holding his tobacco, literally, getting his tea, literally, he said, it's a common market now, but they intend that one day it will be a European super state without any democracy at all. That's why we opposed the common market. That's why we opposed the European Union. Because he said they want to abolish the nation state without asking the nations if they want to be abolished. They want to create a super state whose leaders will be neither elected by us or removable by us, which is the negation of democracy. Now, we opposed the European Union. We fought for Brexit, not for the reasons that Boris Johnson did, as a matter of fact, he wrote, and I've seen them with my own eyes, he wrote two columns for the Daily Telegraph, very expensively too, on the eve of declaring his position on the Brexit referendum. One of them supported leaving, and the other supported staying, and I'll tell you what, the column he wrote for staying was better than the one that he wrote for leaving. And of course there were others, some to the right of him. By the way, you know one of the things that really annoys me, Georgia, I keep reading from Romaniacs, especially today, who are in some kind of paroxysm of grief, <laughs> that this is the most right-wing Tory government ever. If you think this is the most right-wing Tory government ever, you never lived under Margaret Thatcher. You never lived while Margaret Thatcher was destroying this country, this region, this city, laying waste. You need to get a grip of yourself. But in this paroxysm of grief in which they're in, hitting out at everyone, why are you having Brexit celebration in London, one of them said. Have it in Blythe Valley and fuck off, they said. This kind of madness in which a section of our population is in this country for so long. It is at its best a collapse in confidence in our own ability as a class, as a people, as a country that somehow we need a politician from Luxembourg to keep us on the right tracks. A politician from Belgium to protect workers' rights in Britain. We had workers' rights in Britain before the European Union existed. And how did we get them? By trade union action, by the combination of working people. We had them. And the workers' rights that we have lost, we lost during the period we were in the European Union, which didn't lift a finger to stop Margaret Thatcher's anti-trade union laws buttressed by subsequent governments, untouched by so-called Labour governments with record parliamentary majorities. In the hundreds, I asked Tony Blair, about whom more later, I asked Tony Blair, given we've got a majority of over a hundred, why can't you scrap the laws that make trade union action virtually impossible in this country? And he said to me what he subsequently said publicly. For the avoidance of any doubt, there are some things that Mrs. Thatcher did on which I have to build. That's what he said to me. 
I also said to him, by the way, given we've got a majority of more than 100, why don't we introduce proportional representation? Then the Tories will never, ever be in power again. I bet he wishes that he'd done that now. I bet all these fools that turned their back on that demand, which is one of our demands. We demand a democratic voting system in this country where people get the seats in Parliament that they vote for, not on the vagaries of the first-past-the-post system for Westminster elections. But the... <laughs> the collapse in confidence is a very important point. You see, it's not the fake patriotism of which Dr. Johnson said it was the last refuge of the scoundrel. Much patriotism is stuff for scoundrels. But we believe in our people. We believe in their achievements. We believe in their capabilities. If properly led and organized, there is nothing that our people cannot achieve. We believe in Watt Tyler, who led the Peasants' Revolt. We believe in the Chartists. We believe in the Tall Poodle Martyrs. We believe in the working class and its leaders and heroes. We believe in these things. That's not fake patriotism. These were British people, like us. It's not very glorious to say that. I don't know the ancient history, but somebody chided me today for liking a tweet that had, I call her Boadicea, is it Boadica you, you're supposed to call her now? Boudica. Boudica. For, for liking a tweet that had Boudica, why not? She saw an empire coming over the hill into her country and she fought against it. What's wrong with that? Wouldn't all of us do that? Wouldn't we? I surely would. If, as my debut novel posits, it's on sale, 4 99 <laughs> Hitler had arrived here, and he nearly did, wouldn't you have fought him? You would have fought him with your hands if you could, with your lips if you could, with your heart if you couldn't, wouldn't you? Who will accept foreign domination, invasion and occupation? What right-thinking person would do so? Well, of course, a lot of people would have greeted Hitler coming up the mall, including the people that were living in the mall, who were living at the end of the mall in the palace. A lot of people would have sought to sell them financial services and become their quartermasters by appointment to Adolf Hitler. Of course they would. A section of the capitalist class would have, but a section of the patriotic bourgeoisie would not, and the mass of the working class would not. We would have fought against the foreign occupation of our country. I always try to say that to people because I don't know if you remember, I remember it well for obvious reasons, in the early hours after I won the Bradford West by-election, a, a woman said to me from Channel 4 News, I think, are you really supporting the Afghan people fighting against British forces in Afghanistan? I made the point I've just made. Why do you imagine the Afghans love their country? less than we love ours. Why do you imagine the Afghans... Why do you imagine the Afghans will allow foreign armies to occupy their cities and towns and villages and randomly raid and arrest their sons, husbands, fathers? Why do you imagine that it's this imperialist illusion that so much of our mass media and some of our people hold on to. 
The idea that others are less than us. The others should behave differently to how we would behave. That we have to shape. We have to imbue our people with a proper pride in our national achievements, not the least of which was when Hitler was at the Channel Ports and we stood alone and refused to surrender to Hitlerism. We have achievements. We have great people, some very bad ones, but we have some great people. And it's our job as a party of the British working class to organize our people's best intentions, their best capabilities, and show a way in which their lives can be better. So I say Brexit is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the Britain we want to see. It's, it's not sufficient. As it, obviously we can now see, cannot be sufficient as long as Boris Johnson and his gang are ruling the country. They, they want to undercut the living standards of our people, the regulations and protections for our workforce. They want to cheapen and coarsen our national life. Some of them even want to become the 51st state of the United States of America. Tells up for taking back control. But whilst not sufficient, it was necessary. And that's why we celebrate the great victory of Brexit at one minute past 11 last night. I spent a long time in the Labour Party. I joined it when I was 13 years old, two years before you were supposed to join it, but I had then the advantage of looking older than my years. Process, I'm glad to say, has gone into reverse. <laughs> I joined it when I was 13 years old and I loved a lot about it. I loved its language, its vocabulary, its order, its, I don't know, its culture. I loved it. I lived in the Labour Party office in Dundee, in one room, and therefore I shared a toilet with something like 45,000 affiliated trade unionists who met there on a nightly basis. I loved it more than the people that kicked me out of it, that's for sure, after 36 years of membership. But I'm bound to tell you now, as we stand on the edge of new, new labor, led by a peer of the realm, Sir Keir Starmer, still the bookie's favorite, still with the most nominations, still, according to the opinion polls, the likely new leader of new labor, that the Labour Party is finished. It's PASOCT. PASOCT means this, and it's a point I meant to make earlier. We are a small party, but small parties can become big, and certainly big parties can become small. Big parties can become small. Ask Francois Hollande and the so-called French Socialist Party that now have had to move out of their headquarters because they can no longer afford to pay the rates and the rent. Hollande was the president of France and then his party polled 6% in the last presidential election. The fools, actually, if they'd stood down in favor of Mr. Mélenchon, it would have been him in the last ballot against Marie Le Pen, and he would be now the president of France. But they are finished. Pasok, in my youth, were a mighty 
force in Greece. The Papandreou family were the kings of Greece, kings of a republic, if you get my point. Pasok is, if not actually literally extinct, it is politically extinct in Greece. Big parties can become small and very quickly. And I believe that Labour is on the brink of that. I am one of these who charts local government by-election results religiously. I study them, not just the numbers, but what they were last time and what kind of an area that was. And my reading of those runes is that Labour is headed down towards 20% support in this country. Half of the 40% that Jeremy Corbyn polled in 2017. And the reason for that is not Jeremy Corbyn, though there were many things that Jeremy Corbyn did wrong. There were many things that if he had done differently, the outcome might have been substantially different. And I'm not saying something behind his back. I ceaselessly, I won't publish because it's private correspondence, but I ceaselessly lobbied Jeremy Corbyn to stop making these mistakes, to do something different, and they were many and varied. I said, I'll take you shopping and get you a nice suit that will look Prime Ministerial. I know a good barber, a better one than you've got. I know a good optician. I'll show you how to bow a cenotaph so low you'll look like a Japanese general and they'll never be able to snap a picture of you and call it disrespectful. I'll show you how to do your tie up right. And if you're going to go to St. Paul's Cathedral, you better learn the words of the national anthem. And you better sing it, or don't go. From these things, banal, to the big political blunders that he made. And when I say ceaselessly, I mean daily, sometimes hourly. I told him, if you do not stand firm, on the principle you have enunciated all of your life that Israel and Zionism have nothing to do with Jews and Judaism. We are opposed to Israel. We love Jews. We hate Zionism. Unless you say that very, very clearly. They will hound you, I said. I'm talking four years ago. I said, they will hound you until they have destroyed you. And if you say now that something may not be said, be sure they've got a video of you saying it. Be sure they've got a video of all of your friends saying it. And nobody loves a hypocrite. Nobody loves a person pretending to believe something that photographic evidence shows they either do not believe or indeed believe the entire opposite. And this, as we say in Glasgow, if you don't run, they can't chase you. But if you do run, they will chase you until you are so tired, you will no longer be able to fight off their attacks. And this is precisely what happened. Retreat after retreat after retreat, followed by capitulation, surrender, throwing your friends to the wolves. None of it counted. The opposition of the Israel lobby to Jeremy Corbyn on the last day, indeed since the last day, is as visceral, vicious, as it was before he made all those compromises and all those surrenders and all those friends that he threw under the bus didn't 
even, it's an ugly sight anyway, but it didn't even have the merit of being successful. And I told him, ceaselessly, if you allow the Labour Party to become the anti-Brexit party, you will die on what subsequently came to be known as the Red Wall and beyond. Now on that, at least there is now universal agreement. Even John Macdonald, another erstwhile Trotskyite, I've lived so long, I've known them all in so many guises, disguises, perhaps. When Macdonald said, I own this defeat, he was right. It was not Sir Keir Starmer that forced Jeremy Corbyn into the Remain box, into the second referendum box. Corbyn could easily have withstood the imprecations of Emily Thornberry and Sir Keir Starmer. It was the defection of John Macdonald to the second referendum camp that was fatal, that left Corbyn all alone in that shadow cabinet. It was the defection of John Macdonald and, I'm sorry to say, Diane Abbott and others. I was going to say who should know better, but who do know better. It was their defection which forced Corbyn onto the path which was not only disastrous, but was a predictable disaster, a disaster that was predicted, not least by me, in public and in private. I put my job on the line every Friday on talk radio to try to avert this disaster, but they pursued it until the bitter end. And now, just like with PASOK, just like with the French Socialist Party, a whole section of the British working class has had it with Labour. They have not necessarily, and in most cases, had it with the socialist ideas of public ownership, of a decisive role for the state and the economic life of the country, of fairness and justice. They have not been lost to those things but to labor as an organization, as a name, as an icon, they have been lost and I don't believe that they will come back. I really don't believe that they will come back. And I saw in the Daily Mirror today, Sir Keir announcing that if Labour wins the next election, they'll bring back so-called free movement of cheap labour from Eastern Europe back into Britain even though we've left the European Union. That'll go down well in Blythe Valley. That'll go down well amongst the millions of working class people who have been adversely affected by the free movement of capital out and labour in on the, in the 47 years that we have been members of the European Union. So they're actually doubling down on the very things that cost them the Red Wall and a beyond. So I don't believe that Labour, under new ownership, new, new Labour, is going to rebuild its former strength. It will still have strength in the metropolitan areas, in the Isles of Waitrose, amongst a certain class of people because Labour essentially became not a Labour Party but a Liberal Party, a small L Liberal Party, fetishising about racial politics, sexual politics, gender politics, green politics, anything but class politics. That's what Labour... And that dissent was very, very quick. When I entered Parliament over 30 years ago, we had a, a lounge in the Parliament, it was called the Trade Union Room. 
where men in braces put up their feet and slept. I remember I was sleeping in it when, um, what was it, Black Monday, Black Friday, whenever the, when Nigel Lawson's uh, economic, um, uh, the, the steward came in and said, you better wake up, sir, you better get in the chamber, the chancellor's about to resign, and the pound has plummeted and interest rates have tripled and I'd slept through it all with some other trade union MPs sleeping in that room. When I entered Parliament, there were hundreds of MPs, left and right, who had been workers, who had been workers' representatives, trade union officials, miners at the coal face, steel workers, transport workers, all kinds of workers, Labour MPs, who can honestly, nowadays when you're running for leader of Labour, you say, my grandfather was a, was a miner. In, in those days, just 32, three years ago, these workers were the Labour Party in Parliament, left and right. That has completely changed. The class composition of the Labour Party has completely changed, and for the worse. It now represents a narrow and condescending and over-educated, over-privileged, over-entitled liberal section of our population. If I read another tweet of somebody say, complaining of how they're going to have to wait in a passport queue at Gestad when they go for the next skiing holiday, I'm going to scream. <laughs> that section of the population has no understanding. Two of my friends are here, three of them, from Grimsby, a heavily Brexit area. Do you think they're worried in Grimsby about the length of time they're going to have to wait in a passport queue? Their city, their town, their region has been devastated by neoliberal economics personified by the European Union. Devastated, mass unemployment, underemployment. Poverty. And they, my friends can't even escape from Grimsby to visit me in London without paying hundreds of pounds for a train fare for the privilege. Hundreds. So we need to build a new party of labour. And that's what we are going to try to do. We are going to be a party of the working class for the working class. We are eschewing identity politics and concentrating on what unites us, which overarchingly is our class relationship to wealth and power in this society. That's the, that's the real important And we bear no ill will to anyone for what they are or are currently identifying to be. I, I'm really cool on this. Another old friend of mine, I shan't name them, not really a friend, but a, an erstwhile comrade. I shook his hand when he was a man. I kissed his cheeks when he said he was a woman. And now I shake his hand again that he's back to being a man. I'll accept anyone in whatever identity they wish to identify as. We bear no ill will, of course. We all have these identities, Catholic, Irish, Scottish, English, Welsh, gay, straight, white, black. We've all got other identities, but the identity that can unite us all and can change the country, change the world, is our class identity. And that's what we stand for. That's what we stand for. And that's what we will fight for. while I was ahead, but let me say in conclusion, 
that we are blessed actually to have with us a working class poet, raconteur, comedian, writer, who the minute I saw him on YouTube, I instantly knew this was a voice, an authentic voice of the British working class whose words could travel, would travel. I predicted all of the success that is now coming his way. Please welcome the working class poet, Chris McLeod. I don't possess George's uh, poetry, power of, um, of political oratory, but um, so I'm happy to work from notes, but nobody will travel. I can't tell you how proud I am to have been invited to come here today and speak at this rally by a man who, along with Tony Benn, is one of my political heroes. A man who still makes me come out in ghost bumps every time I watch him on YouTube tearing the US Senate in your ass. <laughs> I also can't tell you how proud I am to address this rally today. Uh, the day after we've left the EU, something I know George campaigned for long and hard himself. Uh, but for me, this country leaving the European Union, even as someone who's been at the left all my life, is down to the drive of one man on the right, Nigel. You all know who I mean. I'm just not allowed to use the F word in church. <laughs> <laughs> So, who am I, where am I from, and why am I here? Well, my name is Chris McLeod, and I'm working class. And I'm a comedian from Redcar near Middlesbrough on Teesside, and I'm coming here to tell you why, as a working class Labour man, I voted Conservative, along with millions of other traditional working class Labour voters at the last general election. As I said, I live near Middlesbrough on Teesside. If you've never been to Middlesbrough before, I'll set the scene. It's very rough. Put it this way, it makes Chelmsley Wood look like Belgravia. <laughs> it's the kind of place where if you see two blokes walking side by side, chances are in all probability they'll be handcuffed to each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's rough because it's suffered years of a lack of investment and our steel industry being destroyed. These things have led to higher employment, crime and deprivation. A lot of big towns and cities in the north have had tons of investment. I love going to traditional working class cities like Manchester, Leeds, Nottingham, Liverpool, Birmingham. These places almost have a continental vibe to them now. If you walk through the centre of Birmingham on a sunny morning, it's almost like being in the south of France. You know, there's a buzz about the place. You see tables and chairs on the pavements and you know that means that all the cafes and restaurants are open for business. In contrast, if you see tables and chairs on the pavement on a sunny morning in Middlesbrough, you know that means somebody's been evicted. <laughs> we actually have something in common with Birmingham. Both places have been used as a setting for the poverty porn TV show, Benefit Street. It was filmed on Teesside in a place called Port Clarence between Middlesbrough and Hartlepool. Hartlepool, now there's a place. It's home to ex upper class Labour MP Peter Mandelson. Home to a polluted petrochemical plant home to the Hartlepool contaminated ghost ships, home to a radioactive nuclear power station, and by a strange coincidence, home to frogs with 15 eggs, <laughs> and the highest rates of testicular and ovarian cancer in the country. They don't have any street lighting in Hartlepool. The council have no need because at half past eight every night, young people light up automatically and run around like glow sticks. <laughs> it always makes me wonder how Mandelson ever became MP for Hartlepool in the first place when he had no in common with the people there. I mean, he's a lord. He hangs out with the Rothschilds and royalty. He was even friends with Jeffrey Epstein. Seriously, what does he have in common with the people on Benefit Street? Because our area was always staunch Labour, there was an old saying that went, you could put a red rosette on a pig and people would still vote for it. Well, in Hartlepool, it was worse than that, because in Hartlepool, they put a red rosette on a Tory, and people still voted for it. <laughs> I mean, 
Mandelson was upper class. He's an upper class infiltrator. You might not know this, but in the Napoleonic Wars, the people of Artipol found a monkey on the beach and they'd never seen one before, so they thought it was a French spy and they knew it. <laughs> That's why they called people in Hartlepool monkey hangers, because they thought it was a French spy. Well, it's a good job they didn't mumble Peter Mandelson, isn't it, really? <laughs> Apparently when Mandelson was canvassing in Hartlepool and he went into a fish and chip shop and they gave him fish, chips and mushy peas and he thought mushy peas was avocado or dip. <laughs> and more and more, I've seen people of Mandelson's ilk taking control of the Labour Party, my party, the Tony Blairs and the Tristan Hunts, the Kia Starmers, the Emily Thornberrys. The only time they're desperate to be working class is at election time when they come into a council state with the red rosettes on and they're going, look at me, I'm like you, I'm like you. My now ex-MP was an upper middle class girl from Kent. She knocked on my door and I'm like, you're like me, are you? Are you really? Do you tighten up every time a gas bill lands on your mat? Have you ever run out of electricity and had to go down the paper shop and top up on your key? Ever been on a backy run or smoked snaggy embassy regal? <laughs> After the election defeat, because the working class has abandoned them, it's been hilarious to see them desperately trying to convince us how they're working class. I'd love to go to Kia Starmer and say, you're working class are you Kia? Do you pee in the back? Do you eat fish and chips out of newspaper? Do you call your wife our lass? Do you call your evening meal your dinner or your tea? <laughs> and it's this disconnect between the Labour MPs and the Labour Party and its traditional working class voters, and I've tried to make light of it, that was one of the reasons why I and millions of other Labour voters, people who voted Labour all their lives, didn't vote Labour this time round. These people, these middle class and upper middle class progressive liberals who were obsessed with political correctness and ID politics, are light years away from my class, from the working class. Working class people in the main don't give a toss about PC, they're too busy trying to feed the kids and pay the bills. And these Labour MPs, they don't think like us, they don't speak like us, they don't act like us. It's not our party anymore. They turn their backs on us by deliberately ignoring the majority of their constituents over the issue of Brexit. And for me, for me, that was deliberate. They did it on purpose and they forced Jeremy Corbyn to support it, knowing that they were going to get wiped out at the general election. And that was the only way they could get rid of Jeremy Corbyn, because they tried in two leadership challenges and failed. It was a full detail. As a working class bloke, possibly vote for my MP when she flagrantly ignored me and 68% of her constituents. How could I vote for Labour when they were prepared to ignore the biggest democratic vote that this country's ever had? In essence, in me voting Conservative for the first time in my life, I was voting for democracy. That's really bad, isn't it? <laughs> eh? Having to vote for democracy, or even the idea of it in a general election, you shouldn't have to vote to keep democracy alive in a country. It should be just a given. But not in the last election. Because if Labour had won the last election, or if it had been on Parliament, and had formed a coalition with other parties who wanted a second referendum, or even wanted to scrap the referendum altogether, then democracy would have died. Because no vote in this country would have ever had meaning again. At the last election, I, because the opposition party's stance on Brexit was forced to prioritise. I was being forced to put, in, put things in order of importance. The NHS, workers' rights, austerity are all hugely important. But they're not as important as democracy. But then again, they weren't that important to the Labour Party or the Labour MPs who started the privatisation of the NHS and Airbus in the first place. <laughs> brought in by the Tories in 14 years of being in power. They voted for no hours contracts. And austerity wasn't in that, that important to 184 Labour MPs when they failed to vote against Tory austerity measures in 2015. Yeah, yeah. 
But these things mattered to me, so having to put things in order of importance didn't sit easy with me. But at the end of the day, nothing is more important than the power of our vote. Our vote is the only thing that protects us from the man. It's our last line of defence against those in control, save taking to the streets and peaceful demonstration. We don't want to do that no more. Because working class people are being kept down at heel through being, amongst other things, conned into thinking that they need a non-stop stream of material things and in turn being chained to the floor by debt in order to pay for them. It's like working class people have almost been conned into thinking they're not working class anymore because they bought their own council house and they've got a cheap merc on the drive and the kids have got an iPad, wait for it each. <laughs> for me, working class people are terribly discriminated against today. We get very few, if any, chances for our voices to be heard. We get very few, if any, chances to express ourselves. We look down upon and sneered at and branded thick and racist by these progressive liberals. After the general election, there was death on us online. The thing is, right, that I expect to be looked down upon by the Tories, but I don't expect it from elements of the Labour Party or their supporters, the party that will set up to represent me, my party. And I'm tired of it. For too long, the Labour Party have taken us for granted. It's been like being in an abusive relationship with someone who puts you down, takes you for granted, goes off and courts to the people behind your back, in this case, middle class people who want to remain. Like all abusive relationships, you stay with them because it's all you know, and you actually start to think you need them, until one morning, you wake up and you think, hang on, I don't need this anymore. I'm better than this, and you end it. And that's what happened on the 12th of December, 2019. The working classes after years have been taken for granted, being looked down upon and ignored by the Labour Party. And now these middle class progressives who have joined the party deliberately to scupper Brexit. Um, basically, the, labor, the working classes ended up and ended the relationship. I believe there's a class war taking place in this country. I also believe that the real enemy isn't the right. I think it's globalism, of which the EU is a massive tool. But though we've left it, the EU still has a massive, massive influence. It's creating modern-day slavery. It's restricting our free speech. It has our politicians in its pocket, and as a result, it's fashioned and is fashioning a society in its own greedy, uncaring image. And never was that control of our politicians more evident than with Brexit, when our politicians simply ignored their own constituents to side with the globalist rich man's club known as the European Union. I think it's fantastic that this party is beginning because now left-leaning people, left-leaning working class people have got a voice. But I also believe that at some point the left of the working class is going to have to unite with the right of the working class in order to defeat this globalism. And I'm not talking far right. I mean, I know loads of working class people who have voted Conservative for years and years and years. I'm a left-wing, traditional Labour voter, ex-party member whose family are all Labour people, whose granddad was a shop steward in the 40s and 50s. But I'd had no apprehension at all in encouraging white right-wing voting con working class voters to come and join with the left because it's the only way we're going to beat globalism and loosen its greedy, unjust grip in our society and politicians. And it's the only way if both sides come together, left and right, as George and Nigel Farage did in 2016 to fight for Brexit, and as both sides are doing now in France as we speak, and God knows, God only knows how much I love the spirit and defiance of those French people. Yeah, yeah. The making, forcing their politicians to listen to them. I hope George forming this party is the first step to becoming a whole movement of working class people, no matter what the race, religion or politics, a movement all standing up together and finding a voice. I hope this fight back happens now. 
Because I've got six grandchildren that I love with all my heart. I've got six grandchildren that I want in future to have a voice to be heard. I've got six grandchildren that I want to be represented properly by the people they elect to serve them. I've got six grandchildren that I want to be free. Now, I know I'm only a stand-up comedian. I make people laugh for a living and sometimes I don't even do that. <laughs> I'm now flash, now, and I've never been to university. And some of you might be sat there agreeing with me. And some of you might be sat there thinking, what's he doing here? And you might not be agreeing with me. But if you don't agree with me, don't hate me or write me off as a man. Just keep it in mind that I'm only a normal bloke trying to do my best for people that I care for. It seems to me that today people are all too ready to write people off as human beings just because of a difference of opinion. I've always tried to see through different opinions to see the person beneath. I don't hate or dislike anyone, I just like some people more than others. And that includes the bloke who murdered my dad in 2011. I forgave him and I don't hate him. And I think not hating at a time when it seems that that's all the media want us to do and at a time when we really have to put our differences behind us and start pulling together is essential. So I hope that today is the start of people, especially working class people, pulling together in order to stand up and be heard. And if you don't want to do it for yourselves because you feel like you've been peeing against the wind for years and you're not being listened to, or you feel like you're too old and you've lost your fight and you'd rather sit watching crap tell you with a few cans and a curry, then for heaven's sake, do it for your children. Do it for your grandchildren. Because that's why I'm really here today. Speaking the truths, not in anybody else's heart, but mine. Speaking those truths in my heart, and I'm trying to make a difference. And today, and if I get emotional, I'm sorry, but that's the kind of bloke I am. Take me or leave me. Today, I'm here for Eliza, Lucius, Esme, Willow, Matilda, and my newborn grandson, Miles. I'm here, my gloves are off, and I'm doing it for them, my grandchildren. I hope you join this moment and I hope you all do it for yours. When did we become so lame? When did we allow ourselves to get walked all over, lay down and become so tame? The land that bred the tall puddle martyrs, Jarrow marches and the miners strike. The class that stuck two fingers up to the government when Norman Tebbett told us to get upon our bike. Where's our defiance, our courage, our heart, our passion? Where's our strength, our hope, our pride? When did we allow our politicians to fashion a class that now prefers to shy away and hide? Our wants and all our wishes, one by one, are all being stripped away because no one is daring to challenge, stand up and have their say. It's time to break free from our comfy lives, stand up and fight, take back this sceptered isle from greedy global corporate interests aided by our politicians who all the while say they work for us but all along work on behalf of that global greed. They've turned their backs on their own constituents and what they really want and need. They're inflicting upon us this agenda, which is meant to subdue the proud and brave. It crosses race and gender. They want us all to be their slaves. So come on, all you people, from the north down to the south. Left and right, finding voices. Stand tall and loud. Don't be afraid to open up your mouth. Speak the truths that are in your hearts. Cast off your chains, be free and fly like birds. Bring down this arrogance and corruption with peaceful, direct action, deeds and words. For it's we, not them, that hold the reins of power. Power lies with us, the many and not the few. 
without us power they don't have any because it belongs to me and you it lies with ex dockers down in liverpool it lies with ex miners across the land it lies in every council estate in britain in every class in every working class banner march and band it lies with ex steel workers in wales and teesside it lies in the hands of workers in the ports of Glasgow, Hull and Dover. It lies in the pay packet of every new hours contract worker. So I say to you all, stand up now, don't submit, please, don't roll over. It lies with Geordies, Mac and Scousers, Brummies, Yam Yam, Smoggies, Tykes. It lies with Max and Cockneys and Cornish folk. It lies with White Van Man, down in Essex if you like. It lies with every working class and underclass person who are being threatened with contempt and sheer disdain by our politicians and their globalist puppet masters who really stand to benefit and gain. So let's rise up and fight back. Don't take this abuse of our power any longer. Rise up en masse and stand as one, because together united, we are far stronger. We are the strength. We are the power. It lies within every lad and every lass. So come on, don't be bowed, be tall and proud, and stand up for the children of the working class. Whoa. Thank you, thank you, George. God bless you. Peace. So we want to open the floor now to questions, comments, have a good discussion about what it is that we're doing here. Um, I'm just going to chair so that I can see who's speaking. Can everybody hear us from here? If I sit down, can you hear me? Do I need to stand up? I'm just trying to work out because it kind of feels